So today I'm going to talk about what's the ARM story for VPP. Uh, basically, it's to set the direction, it's going to be we, our target is not just enabling VPP on ARM, but it's making sure that VPP performs the best way it can. So let's get started. Uh, feel, f uh, feel free to stop me if you have any questions, but I'll try to finish fast so that I have more time for general questions. So it's basically divided into two parts, now and beyond. Now is basically what has been the story so far, what's been going in the ARM ecosystem world for the past few months, and beyond is what we are planning to do in future. So let's get started with the now. So devices. Uh, uh, you, can, you can expect VPP to work on almost all ARM devices, but these are the ones which we actively work on. There's active the, uh, members in the community who actively develop on this, and so you can expect support. So all you got to do is send an email to the VPP dev mailing list, and people should be able to resolve issues for you. So the devices are basically uh, Marvel, Macchiato, Ben, High Silicon, uh, the Marvel Thunder X, which was previously Cavium Thunder X, and the Marvel Thunder X2, and the Qualcomm Centric. Okay, now, how did we start? So for VPP, we started with basically a use, a use case. The first use case we tried on was the IPv4 forwarding use case. It's a simple use case. You have VPP, you install a bunch of routes, and send traffic and expect VPP to do the lookup and rewrites and send it back. The variations we tried, uh, so in, in some of the ARM systems, you have the ARM cores in a cluster, which share a L2 cache. So we try to place the worker threads at different locations, uh, like having in their own individual L2 scratch pad or sharing one L2 cache. So these were the variations we tried. Now, this is one effort which has been going on for past three or four months, which is vectorization. So uh, if you're familiar with the VPP code, you should know that there's a lot of SIMD operations inside VPP. And what we did was we tried to identify the SIMD operations in the packet path and try to use Neon as much as we can. Now in our journey, we started off, there are a few ways we started off. First was direct translations. Just find what the SIMD operation has been done right now and find a equivalent Neon instruction and just do it using Neon in Fred 6. Then there were some SIMD operations which was there in other architectures but was not there in ARM, not an exact equivalent. So you, had to, you have to write a small SIMD program to do that. Now, while doing so, sometimes there are some SIMD instructions in ARM which are not there in other architectures. So you could essentially use, change, tweak the code a bit and use it so that it works better on ARM, as in use lesser number of SIMD instructions. Now with our journey of doing all this vectorization work, we, we calculated a percentage improvement of 11% on an A72 core, which is an ARM core. Uh, and then there is a Thunder X2 uh, Vulcan core, which we saw an uh, improvement of 3.36%. So, and there's a lot more to do. Uh, this is just IPv4 forwarding path. Uh, we just uh, translated what, what's already done in SIMD to, what, to a Neon-based uh, solution, but we, we plan to investigate more. Now, this is something which we also did in the past few months, which was architecture-specific function dispatching. Uh, the name sounds a bit complicated, but it's, uh, it's, it's nothing new. It was already done in VPP. We just tried to do it for the ARM ecosystem. So we realized with our investigations that if you use in compiler, some compiler flags like mark and mtune, 
So for different ARM uh, implementations, you get boosts based on the microarchitecture. Now, how, that's fine. Now, how do you deploy it? Because you could always ask somebody to recompile VPP on their individual system and just deploy using that. But we wanted to have a mechanism where uh, somebody uh, doing a binary distribution, somebody taking a binary and just launching it should be able to run the most optimized version of the VPP functions. So there's something in VPP where you could uh, pick some functions and you could compile different optimized version. It's already done for, for example, x86 where they have an AVX version, an SSE version. So what we did was we did the same thing for different ARM microarchitectures. Now this helped us with another effort, which I'm going to talk in the next slide. This is architecture-specific spec uh, loop unrolling. So if you're familiar, again, if you're familiar with uh, VPP code or a lot of packet processing code, this is something which is used, the loop unrolling mechanism, uh, which is a dual loop or a quad loop. So in one of the nodes, which is the IPv4 forward node, uh, you had a quad loop, which is good. Uh, but we realized in one of the microarchitectures which we used, which was an A72 microarchitecture, uh, the prefetch instruction came out to be a bottleneck. Uh, one of the reasons is it's the number of outstanding prefetches is a lot less. But it was not a bottleneck in, let's say, a Qualcomm or a Thunder X2. But it was a bottleneck in one of the microarchitectures. How do you solve that? So you. We, what we did was we reduced the intensity of loop unrolling. That's the more aggressive prefetching. We tuned into a less aggressive prefetching that was dual loop. Again, that's all good, but if I change IPv4 forward to dual loop, that would mean that everyone has to do a dual loop, which is not good, because it's not a bottleneck in other architectures. So we compiled a specific version for A72. So right now, when you deploy a VPP, Binary, you, on an A72, it would detect that it's an A72 and deploy the optimized version of, a, of that IPv4 forward function. You pick that same binary and go to a Qualcomm machine, and you would get a quad loop version of v4 forward. So that's how we sort of solve that. And with the dual loop version of v4 forward, we got an improvement of 4% in throughput. This is the IPv4 forward throughput and the clocks improved by 23%. We plan to investigate more nodes in future, and we plan to do a lot more perf analysis and find out more hotspots. Now, what's the future look like? What are the, first I would like to talk about what are the devices we plan to look into in future. Uh, one of them is a Mellanox Bluefield, which is already a smart neck uh, chip. It's an, again, an A72 based chip, but there's a reference board as well where there's a lot more cores to play around with. That's something which we plan to investigate. Then there is a high silicon D06, which we are expecting next year, which is a A76 core. And then there is Marvel Octeon TX. These are the, some of the platforms which we plan to test and optimize in future. Now, what does the future work look like from an ARM ecosystem perspective? We, for, we want to look into three things, basically. We want to look into TCP host stack, vectorization, which is already being done. We want to continue doing it. And then there's a memory ordering. First, let me talk about the TCP host stack. So now we had always been looking at the v4 forwarding test case. Now we are looking at the TCP host stack test case, but not the traditional container-container talking, the container networking use case, but more of inter-host communication where two different hosts communicate. And on one host, there is a VPP host stack. That's something which we plan to look. Uh, we, we have started with looking at iPerf 3 
as the benchmark, but that's not the only benchmarking solution which we plan to restrict ourselves to. As we go forward, we plan to use other benchmarks for our analysis. So currently, the known problems are that we see a performance gap between kernel and VPP host stack on an ARM64, but uh, we have managed to improve it uh, with some of the patches recently. Uh, this is a bit old slide, so I have not updated those exact patches, but it recently got merged. Yeah, you can go ahead. So obviously this is really interesting. The question for you, is, though, is your the, the testing that you're doing is an ARM uh, VPP plus kernel always, and you compare that with kernel with kernel, right? Yes. Have you tried to compare VPP with VPP with kernel with kernel? Yes. I and it's still lo worse performance? It's, no, it's, it's, it's a little better, but it's still not matching the kernel performance. Okay. So okay. That's, that's something which we are investigating. That's definitely interesting, so let's yeah. take it offline. Yeah. So I have a related uh, point because <clears throat> we've been there. Tools, none of them is correct. The benchmarking tools, iPad 3. Yes. So um, we already have a lot of experience with trying various things. We have iPad 3, WRK2, and a few other little things. And we also have actually Ixia in LFFDIO, mm -hmm. which is the superb tool. Okay. So to the point I made earlier, I think it would be awesome if we collaborate to triangulate between all those different things to, uh, to compare things in their applications. That's the plan. Excellent, thank you. That's the plan. Collaboration is good in open source. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something we'll be, which we'll be working on in the future. Then there is vectorization. You can, what you can expect in future is with, there's something which is coming up, which is already standardized, and you can find it in the internet, is scalable vector extension. It's a, a wider version of Neon, uh, but there are no chips right now implementing it. Fujitsu plans to do it, uh, but you can expect it in the future. Then there's memory ordering. Uh, so traditionally, uh, VPP had all the atomics as sync built-ins, which by default do sequential consistent ordering. What's the problem? As Florian had explained this in his talk as well, the, it's, it introduces a full memory barrier a full memory barrier, uh, as you know, ARM is a more relaxed memory ordering architecture, follows a more relaxed version. So instead of full memory barriers, there are places where you could do away with uh, a more relaxed version of the memory barriers and acquire or a release. And we have seen performance improvement by switching them to atomic built-ins instead of the, sync, the traditional sync built-ins. So that's an effort which I'm closely looking at right now, and I, I think a lot of people in the ARM ecosystem would also join in to improve that and find, identify places where you could potentially use a more relaxed uh, operation and get a performance improvement on ARM, ARM systems. That said, these are the things which you can expect from us in the future. CI, CCIT. OK. Um, so the, as, as everybody in the FIDO community would know, it's basically these three things, VPP path, VPP device, and VPP performance testing. So we have uh, uh, implemented the parallelized version of make test. We plan to sort of roll it out soon, probably in the next few weeks. Uh, there, this is important for us because there have been uh, there have been issues where something has been committed and it breaks on ARM. So this is something which we want to do it ASAP. Uh, and we are trying to fix a lot of test cases which are failing on ARM. So we are pretty close now, I would say. Then there's VPP device. So traditionally, based on VPP device architecture, it's, it's for PCI devices. But we are trying to, it's not a big effort, but we, we are trying to have it for non-PCI devices where you 
don't have an SR, you can't use SR IOV, but we are trying to roll out VPP device on non-PCI devices. That's going to be some, once done with VPP path, that's going to be the next step. Then there's a VPP performance test. This is uh, going to be an incremental rollout where some of the test cases will, like basic test cases will come out. So you will see performance numbers on some of the devices which are there in FIDO lab. And then we would try to incorporate as, much, as many use cases as possible. And that's it. So I hope I have time for questions. Right. Yep, you've got a couple minutes. So, Patrick. Very quickly, I just wanted to say thank you to the ARM team, Sushak, you and, and your team for helping us drive the FDIO, uh, specifically SysIT part, which is hard, um, because of hardware and various things. So um, really pleased with collaboration, um, asking for more. As, uh, as Heather says, the best place to collaborate openly based on merit and, uh, and, uh, and engineering kudos is open source. Um, so really looking forward to have ARM numbers in the 1901 report. Okay. And uh, I think you know, we are looking for enthusiasts with uh, time on their hands and um, to, uh, to help make it uh, happen and make it a showcase. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been a joy working with the FIDO community. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you briefly mentioned about uh, L2 shared cache versus non-shared cache test. Can you please explain the motivation behind doing those tests and what were the results and observations? One of the motivations was if you look at the perf numbers, uh, if you look at the perf analysis, if you try to analyze the BMU events, you would see how many L2 cache meshes are there. So what we wanted to essentially measure is, let's say two worker threads independently use two different L2 caches. Uh, what's the miss rates? And let's say they share the same L2 cache. Whether the L2 cache is big enough, uh, do we need to make changes in the code? Uh, so basically, the motivation behind that was looking at the perf numbers, we did see that having two L2 caches improved in some architectures and improved the performance if two worker threads are independently using two different L2 caches. So that's basically the motivation just to study the behavior. And final goal is obviously to provide, if somebody is using an ARM system, to provide them with the right parameters where they can get the optimized performance. So that's basically the motivation. Okay, so um, on the first uh, version of the Thunder X uh, CPU, the cache line is uh, 128. Uh, did you have a chance to test how this impacts the performance of VPP? This is my first question, and the next one is, uh, one of the advantages of using ARM-based SOCs is um, that they usually pack, and Macchiato being the Armada one packs a packet processing uh, unit device. Uh, DPDK already does some things with there. I mean, the guys there are Im implementing a lot of stuff. But uh, how does VPP take advantage of these um, packet processing engines? Or Because you speak mostly about pure CPU processing, uh, not really taking advantage of this. Thanks. So to answer the first question, the 128 uh, uh, cache line by cache line, we have not measured the performance, but uh, we do, uh, there's a cache line change. So there's code which, where it uses a different cache line uh, size uh, while doing this. But we have not measured the performance impact uh, based on that change. That's the first question. The second question, uh, to be very specific about Macchiato bin. Uh, first thing is uh, Macchiato bin uses if, when you deploy VPP on Macchiato bin, it does not use DPDK. It uses uh, MustDK. Uh, there's a MustDK plugin which uses MustDK to access user space stuff. Uh, whether it uses the accelerators or not is something which I'm not sure. But we can talk offline on that. And yeah. 
but uh, basically, yes, one of the things is with the host stack as well. Uh, one of my, uh, I've been trying to look at is what are the uh, other accelerators provided by the network, uh, NIC cards or other SOCs and try to use those functions more, the hardware offloads, but there's nothing specific from Marvel point of view. I hope that answers the question. Okay, cool. All right, we can take one last question, and then after that, I encourage everyone here to engage with the speakers at break.